When you really look at the scientific data, there's several studies that have looked in large populations, hundreds of thousands of people at longevity, and it appears that you're prone to live a shorter lifespan eating low-carb, high-fat diets long-term. Then the flip side, uh, what you call high-carb, low-fat, kind of the Pritikin style, the Dr. Esselstyn style, the Dr. Bernard style, the plant-based healthy version style. What diet has ever been shown to reverse coronary artery disease and is held up for 30 years to peer-reviewed analysis and scientific publications? And it's only one. It's the high-carb, high-complex carb. We probably need to put in that word. It's just vegetables, beans, legumes, low-fat, no-added oil diets. And they happen to also have activity against cancer. Adult diabetes favor proper cholesterol, proper blood pressure, proper sexual function. <laughs> The Vidal Speaks Podcast. Episode 57, Dr. Joel Kahn, plant-based cardiologist, tells the wholehearted truth. Welcome to Vidal Speaks. My name is Deborah Vidal, former 11-year LPGA golf pro turned classical homeopath, certified plant-based nutritionist and wellness coach. Each week here on Vidal Speaks, we bring you knowledge, inspiration, or natural remedies to help you take charge of your health and feel your best. I believe health is freedom and knowledge is power, so tuning in each week will give you the power to take steps towards freeing yourself from the chains that hold you back from having the energy to do all you want in life. No matter where you are in your journey of wellness, Vidal Speaks can help. I promise. Hi, my friends. How are you today? Well, my day is great because today I get to spend time with you talking about what is real health and how to achieve it. But as always, I want to give you encouragement to walk the path at a pace that feels right for you. I'm not here to make you a vegan. It's not about all or nothing. But as Vanessa said a couple weeks ago, the more you can put that slider towards a full-on plant-powered diet, the healthier you will be. And it's a win-win because doing that also helps you contribute to the healing of our planet and not participating in the violent act of killing animals. So it doesn't matter what your reason is. I just ask you to be curious enough to try a plant-based diet and to see how much better you'll feel. Each of our journeys will be different but it will help to have support along the way. And the Vidal Speaks podcast is a place you can come to and feel good, you guys, because we're all in this together. We're all one and all connected. We can't save us and kill our animals or our planet. If we kill them, then we too die. And in today's times, we are the most divided than ever before. So it's nice to know that we can all come here every Wednesday and be one. And thanks for listening, because I know there's lots of shows out there, so I appreciate that you're here every week, or whenever you stop by, you know you're always welcome. Okay, so today's show is very special. Don't I say that every week? Yep, I do, I know. But that's because every show is special, or I wouldn't have done them, right? But each one of them has its own excitement, and today I'm super excited because you get to hear from a vegan or a plant-based cardiologist. Woohoo! How is that one, guys? It's not like any old cardiologist, like the one that just turned plant-based. It's the famous Dr. Joel Kahn. Dr. Kahn has been a longtime vegan and based his entire 30-year practice on preventative cardiology, so he's been at it a long time. And you know what that means. It means that he has tons of experience treating and reversing heart disease so he knows what works. But his main message is not to get into heart disease. And of course, he's a preventative cardiologist that uses organic, whole food, plant-based diet to sustain his own health and the health of all his patients that come to him wanting to heal or prevent their heart problems. In today's show, I picked Dr. Joel's brain because I'm trying to get you guys to really understand why carbs are not the bad guy and why a high complex carb diet is the healthiest one for your heart, your health, and the only sustainable healthy one for our planet. Finally, you can hear from the mouth of a heart doctor about the dangers of the paleo and all those high meat, high fat, low carb diets. 
Don't get fooled, you guys, by people touting how saturated fat is healthy now and how the paleo diet was the diet of our ancestors. This is simply not true, and it's going to make many people become a statistic of heart disease or cancer. I also speak to Dr. Joel about the most important test to be sure our heart is healthy, so be sure to stay tuned for that and take notes, as I'm sure there are tests you have not heard of. Okay, let's get started. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Joel Kahn, cardiologist. Dr. Joel Kahn is a plant-based cardiologist whose personal mission is to prevent 1 million heart attacks over the next two years. The 1 million heart attacks prevented goal is embraced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Surgeon General. Dr. Kahn's brand of cardiology combines the best of Western and complementary therapies for total healing. He is known as America's Holistic Heart Doc. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Michigan Ann Armour. Dr. Kahn has been practicing invasive, interventional, and preventative cardiology in Detroit since 1990. He is a clinical professor of medicine at Wayne State University School of Medicine and associate professor of medicine at Oakland University Beaumont School of Medicine. In 2013, Dr. Kahn received a certification from the University of South Florida in metabolic cardiology, and he became the first physician to complete the program in the whole world. The American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine has also certified Dr. Kahn in metabolic cardiology. Over the past 25 years, Dr. Khan has improved the lives and vitality of thousands of his patients, taking many of them from chronic health to vibrant living. His devotion to patient care has earned him top honors, and he has been nominated top doc in cardiology for many years straight. His passion for education and prevention is recognized by his patients and peer doctors alike. Reader's Digest magazine selected Dr. Khan for their Holistic Heart Doc column, and their publishing arm published his book, The Whole Heart Solution, which is an Amazon number one top-selling book. His second book, Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses, was published in 2015 and is on the bestseller list as well. Dr. Kahn's medical views are published by the Huffington Post and Mind Body Green, and he is a frequent radio, TV, and podcast guest like today. Dr. Kahn also appears regularly on Fox TV 2 in Detroit as a health commentator and a member of the Yahoo Health Advisory Board. To learn more about Dr. Joel Kahn, please visit his website, drjoelkahn.com. That'll be in the show notes, you guys. Okay, now if that's not enough credibility to open your mind and ears and to end your confusion of whether a carb is good or bad or whether we should be eating high-protein diets, then I don't know what is. Now sit back, but don't relax too much because there's a lot of info coming at you in this next hour. Are you ready? Get a paper and pencil. You may want to take some notes when he starts talking about these tests. All right, you guys, relax, but enjoy. Here we go. Hi, Dr. Khan. I've heard you speak before, and it's been one of my early goals in my podcast to get you on my show. So thanks so much for accepting the invitation to speak with me, and welcome to the Vidal Speaks podcast. Thank you very much, and it's a great honor to know all the good healing you're doing and be part of your community. Oh, thank you. And by the way, I can't let you go without saying we just had Victoria Moran, who's the sexiest woman vegan over 60. And now I'm honored to have the sexiest male vegan. So congrats on that title. You've cornered the market. There's only two of us. So I think the world of her and it's big shoes to fill to be shoes next to her sexy shoes. We both wear the same vegan cowboy boots. So literally can talk about the shoes of the same ilk. But thank you. That's great. Anyways, I'm excited to interview you today because health has so many aspects to it, emotionally, mentally, physically. But when we look at just the physical body, the heart is often the first organ people worry about, especially as they're aging. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions today about heart health and some of the testing that we do and the myths. And I hope that's okay, but we need to be set straight by a cardiologist, okay? Yeah, I appreciate that. I have no agenda. I just have a whole lot of experience and care. 
that people get that right message. And unfortunately, it's not right. And we're going to do a lot of people a lot of good right now listening up and getting some fresh ideas about how to kick in the rear end, the number one killer in America for men and women during Women's Heart Month and Go Red for Women and all the other messages that are kind of concentrated, particularly now this month. Good. So we can't get started because I know many people know who you are already, but let's have you tell a little bit about your story, maybe how you got from medical school to your plant power journey and practicing preventative cardiology now. Yeah, and I'll just do it quick and easy because it actually started before medical school. I grew up in a home where we honored the Jewish dietary laws. I kept kosher and just kind of honored that as something that was a tradition in my family. First day, undergrad, dormitory, cafeteria, 1977, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Walked into the cafeteria with my girlfriend, who fortunately is now my wife of 36 years. And we both had the same reaction. I guess we're eating salad bar for the next four or six or eight years, whatever it is, because it all looked pretty ugly except for the salad bar. And it was the only thing that kind of met our food criteria. And I became a vegetarian September 1, 1977, so 40 years ago. And shortly after that, somebody loaned me a book when it came out by John Robbins, Died for a New America. It really was probably the first book that laid out animal rights, environment, and health, how a plant-based diet could power up all three of those very important components. And then I was already in my cardiology training now from Ann Arbor to Texas to Kansas City. And studies started coming out. And really the last piece of the story. So I did all my medical training as vegetarian and quickly thereafter full vegan. And I finished and began my first job July 1, 1990. I was back in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the university and at a private hospital, kind of a joint appointment. And I was doing balloons and heart attacks and cath lab, and I was the macho heart doctor guy. But three weeks after I started, July 21, 1990, anybody can go look it up, Dr. Dean Ornish, a cardiologist I'd never heard of from the San Francisco Bay Area, had published a paper, and I read it that day, and I read it, and I read it, and read it, that he had been able to document he could reverse heart disease, the same thing I was doing by moving my family all over the country, blowing up balloons and all the rest. He could do it with a fork and a yoga mat and a little bit of gym shoes, having people walk, that he had created a lifestyle centered around a plant-based diet that could reverse heart disease. It was back then, and it still is, number one killer of men and women. And it was powerful data, and it was well done. It was published in super prestigious journals. Very soon after, Dr. Ornish published a book that became a New York Times bestseller called Dr. Ornish's Program for Reversing Heart Disease. And I was early buyer of the book and had my patients read it and share it around. And so my practice right from the get-go was a strange combination of very aggressive medicine, cath lab, heart attack, and all the rest combined with there's no better time to try and communicate lifestyle change to a patient than when they're on your cath lab table, when I have a needle in your groin, when you're having a heart attack and all those kind of things. So I found it was a very effective time to communicate that I'm treating you today, but unless you want me to do it again the year after, year after, year after, let's talk about how we're going to get you out of this. If you play the record forward and you don't exercise, you eat garbage and you are stressed out without a stress management program, you're going to get heart disease. If you play the record backwards and do all those things correctly, you can actually reverse the process. So it's been a very exciting and a very long road of doing this for more than a quarter century for patients and really four decades for myself and my family. And I'm hardcore because, you know, it's pretty much the only thing I practice medicine now is lifestyle medicine and write books and blogs and interviews. And I have my own TV gig in Detroit and own a large restaurant we'll probably talk about. So I've created plant based as kind of the definition of my cardiology practice. That's so cool. First, I want to say about John Robbins and the Diet for New America book. I mean, that was a life-changing book for many people, myself included. I've been vegan, vegetarian since I was 11, more because I loved animals and I was just born to not be able to eat them. But his book, when you learn all those environmental facts, you think, how could we even have another choice? So I too was inspired by his book and maybe one day I'll get him on my show to thank him for that because I know he's changed the lives of many of us. Many, many, many. Many. Either him or his son Ocean would be a great interview. Right. And then I want to talk a little bit just what you mentioned about the Dean Ornish study, because look how long ago that was and look at the work that that man did. And it's scientific proof. And still, why is it 
that people are trying to always denounce something that's already been proven. It's crazy. It just blows my mind how something so well documented, yet there's still people out that that were saying, yeah, but, yeah, but. And then where is our diet gone from the time that his book came out? It's gone backwards. We're eating more meat than ever now. Yeah, you know, you only stay fresh so long in the media. You only stay fresh so long in the science world. Everybody's looking for the new thing. And we really don't need a new thing in cardiology. We don't need a new thing in the world of science of nutrition. We have all we need to know. And there's a small range of acceptable diets for disease prevention reversal. Yet we're dealing with one of the toughest topics, not so much nutrition, but human nature, human habits deep-rooted experiences with food as a child, food with your mother and all the rest. Margaret Mead said it better than anybody that it's famous psychologist that it's easier to change a person's religion than it is to change their diet. And there's pushback. And then there's, it's a business. It's a multi-billion dollar business. And there's been a very strong effort. Some of it may be well-intentioned. I think much of it under the scenes and very much like the tobacco industry to influence the minds of the American public, including the physician American public that dairy's back, butter's back, meat is an essential protein for health and development of a child, adult, and the elderly, often based on very shaky science called meta-analyses, not really new analyses. But, you know, that's what hopefully we can clarify as we're talking. And i give you a little history on how particularly the dairy industry we know is strongly influencing important people, researchers, to apparently present the case that we got it all wrong for 100 years. And the real answer is go back to the farm and eat the animals raw, cooked, churned, pasteurized, but eat the animals and no consideration of the environment, no consideration of animal suffering and a misbegotten message about true health and true prevention. I mean, really, the messages are simple. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, because even if you just look at it for your own health, like you're saying, that should be enough for you to really want to make sure that the science is right. I mean, even if someone says, okay, well, I don't care about animal rights, and I don't care about the environment, which would be really sad, but I want to live a longer life because I don't want to have a heart attack. But then there's all this pseudoscience out there about paleo diet and dairy and raw milk. And not that paleo diet, I know they don't do milk, but then there's the Western Price that advocate raw milk, raw butter, raw cream, all this stuff. But either way, diet's high in meat and fat. And then I think, how does something like that get so popular? I know it's because it's what people want to hear. They want good news for their bad habits, of course. But really, when you think of this, even on a scientific level and as a doctor, it's so frustrating. It must be for you too, for me as a practitioner, to just see how many people get duped into this fad diet. Yeah, and it's pretty hard not to get duped. You see it in the newspaper, the magazines, TV shows. Some of what Dr. Oz presents is amazing. The next day he's got bone broth being the next cure. And it's conflicting. I'm not slamming on him, but it's just everywhere. And unfortunately, trainers and gyms, health professionals, including MDs and DOs, are very often fallen in the pit of misinformation as much as anybody. So when your doctor encourages, you know, hey, I adopted a plant-based diet. I feel great. I lost 10 pounds. And your doctor tells you you better add back meat because you can't get protein and you're going to lose weight and you're going to get weak, not being aware of vegan bodybuilders and competitive athletes and all the rest. It's I feel bad for the public because they're getting bombarded in the easiest thing to do is just eat whatever you're used to eating and forget about it. Hey, they're all confused. I'll wait till they figure it out. And and some of us believe, and Dr. Michael Greger and others have written, the playbook of the tobacco industry for decades was even a little confusion in the public will allow cigarettes to still be sold, cigarettes to be enjoyed in hospital settings. And all we got to do is keep that little element of confusion. And that's certainly what's happened in the health industry in terms of food is as long as we're confusing the public, including physicians, hospital administrators, insurance companies, you know, we can own the world and sell them whatever we want. And I believe that is actually the case, which is why I'll jump on an incredible podcast like yours anytime to hopefully be a voice of reason. I don't own a broccoli producing company. I don't sell edamame around the world and I'm going to cash in if everybody starts buying my brand, but I am very passionate about clarified messages. Yeah. And you are a cardiologist. So can you kind of help set the record straight on, in your opinion, why the other diets are not only a fad diet, but actually downright unhealthy compared to a plant-based diet. I'd like you to give your words of wisdom.
wisdom to the listeners about why it is from a cardiologist point of view? Yeah, in my opinion and shared by several is under the genre of Atkins like diets. And Dr. Robert Atkins developed a giant company of food production that still is available in health food stores, sadly, a low carb, high fat diet, which very honestly has some ability. We all know that people go on the Atkins diet and 10 days before a wedding might drop seven pounds and fit in their clothes better and all but as a long-term lifestyle plan, the ketotic diet, the low-carb, high-fat diet, and that's probably the best umbrella, LCHF, low-carb, high-fat. Not just get rid of junk grains like white processed bread, not just get rid of excess white sugar as much as you can. Basically impossible to get rid of all added sugar, but as much as you can. Everybody's in agreement. There's nothing honorable about Oreo cookies, Twinkies, or snack well cookies. But, you know, not only get rid of those, get rid of all carbs, including whole grains, particularly carbs that are in fruits and vegetables or beans to you know also exit those so you can increase your calorie content to perhaps 60, 70, 80% of calories from fat-ridden foods. That all falls under the umbrella, Atkins-like diets, low-carb, high-fat diets. And it can be repackaged as a South Beach diet. It can be repackaged as a Zone diet. It can be repackaged as a Sugar Buster diet. More recently repackaged as the Bulletproof diet as paleo, Western price. I mean, they're all more similar than not. There are nuances. But when you really look at the scientific data, there are several studies that have looked in large populations, hundreds of thousands of people at longevity. And it appears that you're prone to live a shorter lifespan eating low-carb, high-fat diets long-term. Then the flip side, uh, what you call high-carb, low-fat, kind of the Pritikin style, the Dr. Esselstyn style, the Dr. Bernard style, the plant-based healthy version style. And you could just go at it. I mean, what diet has ever been shown to reverse coronary artery disease and is held up for 30 years to peer-reviewed analysis and scientific publications? And it's only one. It's the high carb, high complex carb. We probably need to put in that word, high complex carb, which is vegetables, beans, legumes, low fat, no added oil diets. And they happen to also have activity against cancer, have activity against adult diabetes, favor proper cholesterol, proper blood pressure, proper sexual function, proper blood sugar control. And you know, there really isn't much of a scientific battle. Now, there are some scientific pieces of data that have studied versions of the paleo diet versus the standard American diet. I mean, if you take a person eating the 65% of calories from junk, that's the standard American diet, and you put them on a, quote, paleo diet in a controlled scientific study where they're suddenly eating fruits, vegetables, lean versions of meat, avoiding sugar, avoiding processed grains, they're going to show some blood markers that improve. And there are aspects of the paleo diet, which we all agree on are great. They don't like dairy. They don't like processed food and added sugar. I mean, every health expert agrees that. But then what's the rest of the plate look like? So there's some short-term studies. There's some dairy and meat money influence. It's very prevalent. There's maybe we've developed an intrinsic lust for meat in this CrossFit gym, macho, gun-toting world. And I don't diss all that. I'm not the biggest tree hugger in the world, but we never speak. I mean, I go to paleo conferences and I'm the only one that will bring up the question, but what about the environment? What about CAFOs? What about animal rights? What about 8 billion people on the planet? And you can't have a food discussion without talking about the impact on the environment. I mean, that's the United Nations talking. That's Oxford talking. That's the USDA talking. The USDA got in hot water because spring 2015, they actually suggested that vegetarian diets were the best choice for the strain on the environment, for dirty waters, dirty oceans, polluted air from cow gas and such. And they had to take that language out because there was such a pushback from the meat and dairy industry when every human should be concerned about what kind of world we're going to live in and what we're going to leave for our children. So, you know, you can go on and on. I mean, but the scientific world is aligned at the vast majority. I mean, there's a lot of paleo, fairly vicious people on Twitter and I interact with them and it's more just entertainment. To me, it's like playing a video game see who I can shoot down with a scientific study. And that's kind of mindless. But we're talking more what are physicians speaking, what are hospitals doing. And we have not made big inroads in places that I think would make major impact. Maybe the one that we made impact is the food industry itself. Tyson Chicken investing in Beyond Meat and Hampton Creek developing non-dairy products that get national attention and recognition. And sales of milk down and sales of plant-based milks up. I think the food industry sees the future quicker than I'm seeing the medical industry, the hospital industry adopted as a therapeutic strategy. But fortunately for people like you and blogs that I write and such, people can get pretty darn good 
unbiased information. I mean, I wasn't born a vegan. I made a meaningful choice based on health, environment, and animal rights. And I and a number of extremely well-intentioned people just feel passionate. We've got to set the record straight to help people because when they're putting butter and coconut oil mixtures in their coffee, they're just accelerating disease. And that's unquestionably, it's just nonsense. Yeah. And do you think that maybe some of these other cardiologists don't recommend nutrition or plant-based diets because they themselves realize they could never give up their meat? There's some of that. Doctors are people and they had mothers and they had upbringings and they have taste buds and they haven't eaten the incredible colors, textures, tastes and nutritional benefits of amazingly prepared raw and cooked plant-based foods and spices. So one, they haven't been exposed to it. You're not going to find it in a hospital. You're not going to find it at pharmaceutical-based lecture on a new oncology drug because it's going to be a steak restaurant almost always. And so they haven't been exposed. They're not getting it as information at Grand Rounds or in journals. There's no drug rep who brings the latest nutrition information. So, I mean, they don't have the information. They read Time Magazine. They read the Wall Street Journal that seems always to have a Gary Taubes article for three pages. And tell me the last time any article like that by Dr. Dean Ornish was blasted across the New York Times or Wall Street Journal for three or four pages like it was an advertisement, but it was just, why does Nina Teichels, the author of Big Fat Surprise, a journalist who clearly promotes disease causing diets as her mission and passion and accepts money from some foundation in Houston that promotes the same philosophy. Why does she get this kind of write-up? And the doctors read it, and the doctors, oh, it looks like everything's been redone, and even the American Heart got into a controversy in the USDA about whether cholesterol is any more a target of our focus and evaluating treating heart disease, and it clearly is, and it always has been, and always will be, but confusion is the enemy. The clarity is there. Some of your listeners may not know this. There's an organization called the American College of Cardiology. You've probably heard more about American Heart Association and Go Red for Women and such, but American College of Cardiology has 22,000 cardiology members. And the president last year was a physician from Chicago, Dr. Kim Williams. He's been a friend of mine forever. And he's been vegan for about 12 years because he lost his weight. He lost his blood pressure and cholesterol problem. He understood the literature. And he had a quote during his presidency of this large international organization that there's only two kinds of cardiologists. They're either vegan or they simply haven't read the literature. And I do think that second part is true. I was so excited yesterday, and then I'll stop talking. I had a phone voicemail message in my office in Detroit, a very tentative young female doctor from San Francisco. I'm doing research on liver disease, and there's something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 25 to 30 percent of adults, their liver is engorged with droplets of fat, all related to processed food, American Western cheese, dairy, egg, meat diets. And it can lead to cirrhosis, and it's a serious health concern. She's become plant-based. She's interested in studying formally. No added oil, plant-based diets in the mode of Dr. Ornish and Mr. Pertikin and Dr. Bernard and such. And she said, I'm reaching out to you because I've read some of your stuff online and it looks like you're aligned and you actually talk about liver disease and plant-based diets. And she happened to mention it. My father's a cardiologist in Toledo, so I'm just kind of interested. Well, long story short, her father is probably the most famous cardiologist in the Midwest in terms of using integrative cardiology, metabolic cardiology. He's been one of my mentors and teachers. And she said, and I convinced him finally to go plant-based. This is a man who's read more literature than any university professor I know. He's in private practice in Toledo, Ohio. He went plant-based, and I called him yesterday. I said, Jim, you're on board, and I knew you would if you ever would read the damn literature about what's there. And so I'm sorry that was a long-winded explanation, but there's no incentive for a physician to sit down. That's why I love Kaiser Permanente has published a couple articles, Plant-Based Nutrition for Physicians. Okay, in like seven pages, if you'll read it, you'll get the last 70 years of nutritional research in a way you can appreciate. You still need some skills. How do you shop? How do you cook? How do you travel? How do you eat out of the country? All that. But, you know, if somebody's willing to seriously look at it, take my advice, eat plants, not animals, limit the oil, and you'll enjoy robust health, hopefully for your whole life. And when you were saying that about that they were eating this sad diet and filled with animal meats and eggs and dairy and junk food and processed food, but those results can be the same even if you're just eating the what they call the healthier paleo diet where you're doing lots of high protein, which then means high fat and low carbs. I mean, I think that's where people get off track because they want to say, well, I eat healthy. I don't eat that processed food and I don't eat a lot of sugar. And like you said, that's great. 
great, and that's a step up from the sad diet. But even the diets where people think they eat a clean diet of e- eating grass-fed animals and eggs and may- in paleo case, not dairy, but lots of animal meats, don't you feel that there's some very serious ramifications ahead for these people with their cardiac health? Yeah, cardiac disease is a complex problem. Nutrition is part of it. Genetics are part of it. The rest of lifestyle, exercise, stress, sleep, environment, air pollution. I mean, it's not a simple single factor, but there's some things we can control. And to answer your question, yes, by a plant-rich diet or a plant-only diet, you have clearly taken the biggest step you can to win a trifecta, which is to improve your own health, to optimize the chance you're going to have a clean planet to live on, and to also embrace in a world that increasingly seems to be rather contentious and angry and protesting every day with your fork and your plate 80,000 times in a life. You're saying, for me, kindness matters. And made, I don't know the name of the chicken, the cow, and the lamb that's benefiting from this decision, but it still matters because somewhere there's an animal that didn't suffer because of what I do. And it just spills over to the rest of your life. When I was at a restaurant in Sarasota the other night, and the only thing I could find to eat was, and usually was, because I went to Happy Cow and did my usual thing, and I could find steamed broccoli, cauliflower, and asparagus on a plate as a delicious, but you know, not really dramatic, gorgeous meal. And a two-inch cockroach crawled out of the plate across my table at an elegant upscale restaurant. I didn't squash the thing. I just brushed it quietly to the floor. I actually, <laughs> I actually wanted to brush it onto the guy eating the 14-ounce steak to the left of me, but I didn't quite have the mindset to do that. But I'm just saying it does spill over. And it's a little act of peace and ahimsa that you can do every day with your fork and your knife by uh, concentrating on non-sentient creatures on your plate. I think it matters. I think it spills over. I get angry. I have a temper. I mean, I'm not a wimp, but I still think the guys and the meat eating and the psychology and the whole thing about guys and meat, if they really understood that their penis, I'm going to say it out loud, their penis would work better if they'd get off of dairy and cheese. And we know this. We know it's sexual response. I'm writing a book right now. It'll be out this summer with Ellen Jaffe Jones, a pretty well-known vegan author, athlete. We're writing a book called Vegan Sex that she's handling the lady plumbing. And I got the easy job of handling male plumbing. I mean, you know, how hard is that? I mean, (laughs) But what goes down must go up. But that'll happen a whole lot easier with arteries that supply your flagpole that aren't clogged up with cheese and beef and eggs and all. And that's known. It's a vascular response and things like arugula and things like kale and things like watermelon, things like pine nuts and all are rich in the precursors. Uh, They're basically, they are literally dietary Viagra, dietary Cialis. So if we could get guys focused on, I'll be better in the sack. If I don't have a yellow sack of Egg McMuffins, they say be an animal in bed, don't eat it, don't have it on your plate would be a nice little summary of all that. Right. And then you can sell sex a lot easier than you can sell, eat a vegan diet. So, Well, I hope that the consumers will buy that book favorably priced at your local Amazon readership this summer. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. That's very cool. So what about fat? I know it's in the vegan world, even there's a little bit differences opinions. And I just wonder about oils. Most would say limit your use of oils. And I'm sure you're probably in that camp. But I just wonder, does it vary for different individuals depending on their blood work? And are good fats like avocado seeds and nuts okay for most people or not everyone? How would you answer that? I'll say I've studied and read and written on this much more in the last two, three years. And if you had asked me this question a couple of years ago, I would have given a less specific answer. So there's more scholarly people than me, but I keep up with this. And I've taken on as my onus to battle in social media blogs, panels with other people that have the opposite opinion. So the story goes real quick. Although in 1913, it was identified that our arteries clog up with material cholesterol that looks a lot like fat, butter, cheese and eggs. And in animal models, 1913, we're talking a long time ago, you could feed animals butter and they'd get clogged arteries. You feed them plants, they didn't. And then came some seminal work by a physiologist in Minneapolis named Dr. Ansel Keys, K-E-Y-S, who very famous individual, lived to age 100. And he studied as best as could be done at the time with very, very accurate science that diets high in animal saturated fat. I'll give you the classic example. 
were much more prone to heart disease and early death than animals that weren't high in animal saturated fat diets that weren't high. So the classic example for one is the country of Finland, and actually particularly East Finland, which is near Russia, in the late 60s, early 70s, had the highest heart attack rate in the Western world. 38-year-old lumberjacks, they're physically active, they're not overweight, were dropping like flies, literally 10 times the rate of heart attacks versus the United States, and many fold more than Japan. And there was a concerted effort to analyze their diet and implement a social program in a park called North Karelia, Finland, in eastern Finland. And within five years, they dropped the heart attack rate by 85%. Dramatic social program. What did they ask these people to do? Please don't use butter 10 times a day on your cheese on top of your piece of sausage because that was a common meal in Finland. Please substitute and people will be a guest. Margarine, eat a fruit or vegetable. One a day was the goal. That was the increase. Oh, my gosh. And then they spread that through the whole country of Finland. And the entire country of Finland, heart attack fell by 80%, not 85%. But it was a dramatic social experiment that exists to this day successfully and impacted. So we know that animal saturated fat, for many pieces of data, is unhealthy. It engorges our muscles with fat and makes us prone to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. It engorges our liver with fat and this condition that's really pretty epidemic called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It makes us overweight and it clogs our arteries. So then you talk about plant fats. And we know that there's a gradient. If you have a diet, and Finland was the experiment, but Harvard School of Public Health has followed up on this all over the place. If you go from animal fats to plant fats, so they've done research in the last 18 months in a series of like over 100,000 nurses and doctors. When they transition their diet from animal fats, butter, lard, processed meats, red meats, to polyunsaturated fats, vegetable oils, canola oil, olive oil, there was a significant drop in cardiovascular events and death. You're more likely to be alive if you stop eating animal saturated fat laden foods, cheese, eggs, dairy, meats, and all. And even vegetable oils were a very powerful substitute that many people would react to and say, well, I've heard all this about omega-6 and inflammation. It's still a heck of a lot better, including studies published in the last two months by the most prestigious School of Public Health in the world, the Harvard School of Public Health. So it's new, it's current, it's relevant. And if you make that next step and you actually start, as you mentioned, so for the average person who's young, who's healthy, who's active, who's not dealing with weight, adult diabetes, or heart disease, eating nuts, seeds, avocados, even occasionally vegetable oils, organic canola oils, very high in omega-3, which is for plant-based eaters a serious need to meet, and maybe a little bit of a super, super clean extra virgin olive oil may not be a bad choice. But 75% of America is overweight or obese. 25 to 40% are type 2 diabetic or pre-diabetic. So for most people, eliminating or limiting oil is actually pretty important for their weight control, for their blood sugar control, for their cholesterol control. And so I favor in my restaurant, which is 100% plant-based, completely vegan. We have an extensive no added oil menu. There's literally not a drop of oil in preparation. It's not hard to do. It's a few skills to learn about vegetable stock and other ways to cook and bake without added oil. And it is very popular and I think it's delicious. Food actually tastes like it's supposed to take if you don't soak it in oil. So if somebody's listening and they're an athlete and their weight's great and they think their risk is low, and maybe we'll talk about that. How do you really know the status of your heart health? Well, we're going to get there on that for sure. But for most, oil is a very low nutrient food. I mean, olive oil, if truly fresh from the tree, and extra virgin olive oil does have antioxidants and things called polyphenols. But you've stripped, and olive is a much, much more nutrient dense food than olive oil. You've stripped the fiber, you've stripped the magnesium, you've stripped the electrolytes, you've stripped many of the powerful active components, and you're left with fat. You get multiple times more antioxidants from a bowl of blueberries without the fat than you get from olive oil. You know, don't go to olive oil for your antioxidants. Go to brightly colored fruits and vegetables for your antioxidants. That's where they were meant to come from, whole foods. So it's confusing, but, and I say, just in case anybody's pushing back to what I'm saying, anybody who believes that the scientific data has shifted, the cover of Time magazine, Eat Butter, New York Times, Butter's Back, the studies that were published, 2010, 2014, are the two major studies. They questioned, and they actually weren't original research. It's a technique called meta-analysis. Let's look at all the old research and reinterpret it. And you can slant that potentially by which studies you leave in, which studies you leave out. But the conclusion of those authors that everybody relies on said, it may be that the previous feeling that saturated fat directly is a cause of heart disease may be questioned and may not be as solid a foundation as we thought. None of those studies said 
We've identified that adding saturated fat by putting butter and coconut oil in your coffee, by adding back red meat, by adding back egg yolks, by eating more full-fat dairy cheese, none of those studies said that we've shown that that's actually a benefit. And then immediately... The media says it's a benefit and butter's back and add it in. And I know cardiologists in London who proudly announced in the New York Times, I put butter in my coffee every day and I eat full fat dairy cheese and you should too. It's completely irresponsible. It's completely inconsistent with the data. They never showed it was helpful. And the studies themselves, they're like Swiss cheese. There's so many problems with the study design and they've been roundly criticized by knowledgeable people in epidemiology and statistics. So it's nefarious out there. So let me tell you a quick little story. It's reported on the web by Abe Lincoln. You know, every Abe Lincoln said everything on the web that you read is real and authentic. No, it's not Abe Lincoln. A very prestigious professor of uh, epidemiology in Europe has written and has been quoted widely, and I've emailed them, and it's authentic, that in November 2008, the dairy industry met in Mexico City, international dairy industry, and part of their agenda was we're losing market share to plant-based milks. We're losing market share to cashew-based nut cheeses just at the beginning. We need to remedy this, November 2008. We need to find sympathetic researchers, public figures, and we need to support their efforts to put dairy back on the American plate. Immediately, you saw that absolute nonsense about chocolate milk being a refueling energetic gym food. And Now, my gym has those signs everywhere because they must get paid advertising. You know, and then you started to see these studies come out. There's a MD researcher in Oakland, California, Ronald Krauss. He's called Dr. Lard by John McDougall because he takes money from the butter and dairy industry. It's right on his curriculum vitae. I don't make this stuff up. And he lectures to the National Association of Butter Makers or Dairy Makers. He put out a paper in 2010. You can just track that what we've seen in the last six to seven years really does resonate with this international effort by a very powerful and wealthy food provider, the dairy industry, to just confuse the public and influence physicians and dietitians. Fortunately, the American Association of Nutrition and Dietetics just came out with a very positive paper promoting plant-based nutrition, pre-birth, pregnancy, childhood, adulthood, even in the elderly. They're finally getting it. But until then, they had very mixed feelings about you know, So the dietitians and hospitals and everywhere would often encourage people to add back meat protein to their diet to make it complete. We're finally seeing some improvement, but it's money, it's money, it's money, it's money, it's money that's causing all this confusion. Time to take a break. And while you do that, I would like to remind you guys that if you're interested in buying a water distiller, check out my products page and scroll down to the bottom and you'll see the one that I own. It's the countertop version and I just love it. And if you invest in one of these, you'll finally have 100% pure water with no nanoparticles of plastics and environmental toxins that don't come out in filters. But also remember, if you're someone that's drinking distilled water, don't forget to add some ionic minerals to your regime on a daily basis. My favorite ones are good state ionic minerals. You can check them out on my products page at the bottom too. Lastly, for those of you that are using that Amazon banner, thank you so much. And if you're not, then I'd love to ask you to consider it. All you have to do is click on that banner on my website and then just do your shopping. It costs you nothing, and they give me a little commission that helps support the show. I so appreciate all of you doing this. Okay, you ready to get back to the show? Let's do it. You're a doctor, and you know this research, and you know how to look at papers and authors and to know what has some merit, but the average person that's going on the internet to get some answers, you'll find millions of articles written by Weston Price that just tout the benefits of raw dairy and how eating animals. And gosh, there's so many things they say that just to me are just outright wrong. And, you know, the average person doesn't know like how to determine what they read is by a good source or a bad source. And I think that's where the problem lies. But it does create that confusion, which is what they want because they're losing ground. Yeah, I agree completely. And they're vigorous and they're active. And again, and they're rich. Yeah, they have money and they get this access to media you never see other people get access to. And it's the sugar. It's true, apparently, that in the 1960s, three Harvard researchers took a small amount of money, 
to publish a paper. I've read the paper. It's an unreadable paper. It is such dense research, and it may conclude a little softer than maybe they could have that sugar in the diet was a risk to our health a little less vigorously, perhaps, than they could have concluded in their language. But I'm going to tell you, this wasn't the cover of Time magazine, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. This paper was, I have no idea how many people read this thing. I'm sure it had like near no impact on the world, but yet it's now the conclusion that everything we learned that every researcher was crooked. Dr. Ansel Keys must have been crooked. They just pounce. And why does Gary Taub, some journalist who happens to be very good at selling books, get all this prominence when Dr. Garth Davis wrote a book called Proteinaholic with a thousand references by a practicing physician boarded in weight management? And I sure didn't see his three pages in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times. It's dirty, fatty, milky money. Yep. That Proteinaholic book is one I had my patients read because it just is a great book. It's easier to read than the China study. It's just he has so much research in it. It's fantastic. Let me ask you a question that when you were talking about saturated fat and cholesterol, you know, one of the things I would get being a vegan for so long, people would say it's really dangerous because you need... Uh, saturated fat for your brain and cholesterol, and you need cholesterol for your body to make hormones. So can you help clarify that? Yeah, a kernel of truth doesn't make a whole ear of corn. There is nobody on the planet that has a cholesterol of zero. There's nobody that gets treated and gets their cholesterol zero. Everybody's got cholesterol in their blood, even those that are intensely treated with the most powerful pharmacologic and dietary therapies there are. Natural experiments, uh, people living in primitive societies, Papua New Guinea and the Yanomamo in the Amazon basin, run cholesterols of 80, 90, or 100 naturally, total cholesterols. Excellent vitamin D levels, they're outside. Excellent hormone levels, uh, no impact from it. There's also, I've participated in some research. I've published a paper in a major medical journal, quite prestigious, that there are some genetic variations where you end up your whole life with a lower cholesterol because of genetic factors on cholesterol production. And the side effect of having a cholesterol 100 your whole life is actually there's extended longevity, there's extended lifespan. This was a study of well over 100,000 people around the world. And even recently, I mean, I'm not an advocate of heavy, heavy drug therapy, but the Cleveland Clinic just published a study of about 800 serious heart patients treated with the most powerful prescription cholesterol-lowering drugs anywhere. They often got their cholesterol down way under 100. What they showed was no side effects and actually reversal of plaque. Now, I'd much rather do it with lifestyle and plant-based. Not everybody can achieve cholesterol control with lifestyle and plant-based because they've got some genetic influence that's pretty powerful, but it's nonsense. So my patients who have a cholesterol 350 and I'm concerned about their cholesterol 350, often have low vitamin D, low testosterone, kind of the argument doesn't hold up. And the flip side, healthy 25-year-olds, their cholesterol is 105 and their testosterone is 900. So... Well, my argument to people being a woman, you know, is say, hey, look, I had a really low cholesterol in my life, you know, 130 or less. And my dad being a medical doctor would send me to dietitians who would keep telling me I had to eat more protein and more fat. And I never went through menopausal symptoms or hormonal symptoms. And yet they're trying to tell me that it's really dangerous to have hormones. And they're all the ones that are having hot flashes and all these problems. So there's something wrong. I agree. And, you know, so the only question that if somebody's physician, dietitian, CrossFit instructor makes those comments, you know, you need your cholesterol for why, ask the question, well, how much do you need? I don't understand. Do I need a cholesterol of 100, 150, 200, 300? What if my cholesterol is 500? Is that too much? And the answer, one, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be a pain in the butt to anybody. One, they're probably not going to have an answer. And two, it really points out from native healthy cultures, which is what we all want to be, native healthy people, that we are going to do just fine if you're on a healthy exercise, stress management, your weight's optimal and your cholesterol is 110. I do. I have also had patients show me, but I got this bottle of cholesterol pills from my chiropractor, naturopath, DO or MD, and they want me to take this pure cholesterol. To, I mean, I barf and... That's the thing I'll smack out of their hand and stomp on, not the two-inch cockroach on the table. So it's <laughs> nonsense, but we've lost our brains in this process. Okay, so as a cardiologist, and I know it's not across the table, what do you think a good cholesterol level is? Not by drugs, but just a healthy, good cholesterol. Where are you happy with your patients? If somebody's well and doing fine, I mean, there's not really a too low a number. There's not a disease of too low a cholesterol. It doesn't exist. 
Maybe there's a rare genetic disorder in children. I don't know. I'm an adult cardiologist. But if you walked in my office and you're athletic and you're young and you're healthy and your total cholesterol is 85, and you know, and you give me a dietary history, it sounds like it's a pretty complete, well-rounded, whole food, plant-based, pure diet. I'm going to congratulate you. But you know, that's unusual. 110, 130. I mean, we've had data since the early 1960s. A natural total cholesterol, even a drug-induced total cholesterol under 150. I don't say you're bulletproof. The most prominent cardiac pathologist in the country, maybe the world, is an 85-year-old physician in Dallas named Dr. William Roberts. He has handled more heart arteries than probably any human in the world. And he'll confidently tell you, with all the integrity in the world, if your cholesterol is under 150, you will not have a heart attack or a stroke because no matter what else is going on, whether you got blood sugar, smoking, or other things, if the cholesterol is not there to get into the wall, the artery, and start to block it, you may have disease, but you're not going to develop a plaque and have a heart attack. I think the equation, and it's bold of me to ever question Dr. William C. Roberts and his world-famous reputation, but there are other complex factors, and we live in a world with plastics and BPA and phthalates and all this other garbage and sugar and air pollution, but get your cholesterol down by limiting your oil, eating plants, eating oats, eating fiber-rich foods, and you're going to be in a very good place. And Dr. Joel, is 150 the high end, would you say, of good health? Yeah, I mean, it goes up a little bit. There's the HDL, the LDL, triglycerides. I mean, we tend to look at the whole profile. But if your total cholesterol is 120 to 150 naturally, don't have anxiety, don't add in cholesterol pills, don't add back egg yolks and uh, full-fat dairy cheese, just be happy with it. Again, we've always known. I knew somebody had a low cholesterol and had a heart attack. Well, duh. We've known for 60 years, cholesterol is one risk factor. So is smoking, so is blood sugar, so is genetics, so is high blood pressure, so is lipoprotein A. I want to get there. The next question I really want to ask you, though, before we get into that is, can you just briefly explain, I know we don't have video, but just explain how a healthy heart works and then what a heart attack is and what a stroke is, what happens? Sure. Heart attack's a little simpler because most heart attacks are... There's three arteries to the heart. The heart's a pump that squeezes 100,000 times a day with three beautiful arteries on top about the size of a number two pencil. Should be completely clean and free of obstruction. And usually it's a process that for months to years, an artery's been degraded by plaque, by atherosclerosis, cholesterol, calcium, scar tissue. And then a heart attack is typically one day it gets worse, kind of like Mount Vesuvius in a volcano. It could be a 40% blocked artery that suddenly is 99 or 100% blocked because clots there. It could be a 90% artery that's suddenly gotten worse. But you don't have enough blood flow. You start to feel bad and your heart starts to die. And you might die right then or most of the time you survive, but you feel crappy. And if you're smart, you're in an emergency room. And my former life, I was wheeling you as fast as I could down the hall of the cath lab to clean out your junk. And that's why I went into preventive cardiology because I said, you know, let's stop this at the root cause, which is your fork, your spoon, your knife usually. Yeah. And what causes the plaque? Everything we've just talked about. Why do those arteries get? It's not natural. There was a fundamental change in our understanding in the 1960s that uh, heart blockage isn't just natural aging. It's unnatural to have a bypass. It's unnatural to have a heart attack or stent. And it's 80 to 90 percent of the time lifestyle factors of which diet is a huge portion. Stroke's a little more complex because you can have a stroke from a blocked carotid artery, which is the same phenomenon as a heart artery. It can clot out suddenly, but you can have a stroke based on high blood pressure alone without clogged arteries. You can have a stroke because of a common rhythm problem of the heart called fibrillation without blocked arteries. So it's a little bit more complex to pick and define. Atherosclerosis is one cause of stroke and one cause of dementia, but not the only causes. And is high blood pressure related to heart problems? Absolutely. Actually, on a worldwide level, more people die. There's a fascinating study called the Global Burden of Disease Index. Multiple publications all over the world involving millions of people. High blood pressure is actually the single most frequent cause of death worldwide compared to any other. So directly leads to stroke and heart attack, kidney failure, peripheral vascular disease and amputation, dementia. But if we could handle high blood pressure, we would have made a tremendous inroad. And what dietary pattern has naturally the most normal blood pressure of any? And the Adventist Health Study, Loma Linda and such have shown us vegan diets have by far the lowest blood pressure compared to any other combination. Yeah, so it's predominantly, as I always say on this show, it's a lifestyle disease. 
high blood pressure. I know it can have other factors, but... Right. It's certainly excess salt, maybe in some part excess added sugar, weight increases, poor sleep, stress, lack of exercise, all of the above contribute to the fact that probably 70-80% of high blood pressure could be prevented and medicines not used with lifestyle. Yeah, great. That's so cool that you can do so much with diet and lifestyle, and that's why you call it lifestyle medicine. Correct. Okay, let's talk about some tests, right? I know the modern medicine has kind of stayed in this old-fashioned way of testing, but you have some great recommendations because I listened to you on another show one time, and you talked about this coronary artery calcium scan. That is a really important test. I would like you to tell us what is so important about this, and when would you use it? Well, thank you. And I'll do this fast in bullet points because you're right. If you just put in my name in Google and some of these topics I've written on them because I'm so passionate about it. But so basically, you're 45 years old or 50 years old. You see your internist. You say, I feel good. Yeah, my dad had bypass at age 62 and I haven't been making the gym so much because work's stressful and we're reorganizing. But I mean, I feel fine. You're going to get some blood work. Hopefully, your blood sugar, your total cholesterol, you'll get your blood pressure checked. You won't get an EKG. You're done. And you're told, you know, things look not bad. Just try to exercise a little more, eat a few more fruits and vegetables. You probably won't hear that from your doctor. You might. And you're done. Now, in reality, that's taught you nothing about what's really going on in those three heart arteries. It'd be the equivalent of you talking to your doctor, my breasts feel fine. Okay, we'll skip a mammogram for the rest of your life. Or, you know, I haven't noticed any cancers falling out of my rectum. Okay, so we won't get colonoscopy. I mean, we have have this mindset that we don't have a tool to screen the heart like we do screen breasts by thermography or MRI or mammography like we screen colorectal cancer with stool uh, blood analysis as well as colonoscopy. In reality, that's simply not true. And I'm not being radical. This is what the science says, that about 15 to 20 years ago, it was recognized if you lie down on a gurney, go into a CAT scan machine, hold your breath for 10 seconds, and you go home. You've had no IV, no iodine, no exercise. You can see heart arteries and you can see if they're calcified. And when we talk about atherosclerosis or blockage or narrowing or aging, 99% of the time, the plaque in the arteries is a combination, kind of like cement is a combination of lime and pebbles and water and other stuff, but I don't make cement. Plaque in arteries is a combination of which 20% is calcium. Well, it turns out there's never heart in the calcium, and even a little bit of calcium in the arteries shows up on these CAT scans like a bright light, and you get a report back that says your arteries are not calcified. It's called a score of zero. You've got an unbelievably optimistic prognosis to avoid heart attack for the next 10 years. If you're a diabetic, you've got an optimistic prognosis for the next five years. And work on your lifestyle, but good news. You know, next time you burp, it's a burp. It's not a heart attack. On the other hand, there's a number, and I have patients that go for that test, cost maybe $75. Right now, there's a hospital in Miami for Heart Month doing it for $25. It's ridiculously inexpensive. State of Texas, it's an insurance benefit. It's covered in your insurance plan because they're more forward thinking about this, more proactive. But at any rate, uh, you know, I have patients that come to me, and that number is 1000 or 500 or 1400 Basically, their arteries are riddled with atherosclerosis, aging, calcified atherosclerosis, and they had no clue. And there's way more than a thousand very excellent scientific papers that indicate that the risk goes up dramatically as the number goes up. And fortunately, we've got programs to deal with it. So if you're a zero, you're kind of on a maintenance, healthy lifestyle program. And if you're a thousand, you better get in front of somebody that knows what the heck they're doing. And frankly, and very humbly, there's very few people. My entire practice is this field of early heart detection and early heart reversal using plant-based diets as the foundational component, but some integrative cardiology with it. So that's something that every city, when I get a call or an email or a Facebook message from somebody, I live in Spokane. I heard you talking on Rich Roll about calcium scoring. Where do I get it? On Google, there's always the hospital. Maybe it's $200, not $75 like it is around Detroit. But you're going to find it. You may need a physician prescription. Your primary care doc may not completely understand. Again, Google my name and coronary artery calcium scan, coronary artery heart scan, coronary calcium scan. It'll show up. You may have to bring an article and say, I want this test. I'll pay the $100. I just need your prescription. If it's abnormal and nobody can find anybody to work with them on it, 
search me out and I'll find you somebody because amongst a group of preventive cardiologists around the country. Now, I know you want a score of zero, but what if you were 100 or 20 or 10? I mean, is it what is? It's the one, it is disease. Two, science says there's a difference over the next five to 10 years between zero and 10. There's a difference between zero and 50 in terms of your risk of heart attack and stroke. You're developing, and it's also an age phenomenon. If you're 72 years old and you're a 50, it's very different than if you're 42 and you're a 50. And even the way the data is usually presented makes that point. So your report would say if you're 42 years old, let maybe say you had a brother age 45 had a heart attack and you want to be a little more aggressive about your own health. And if you're a 42, it's probably going to say for that age, you're in the 90th percentile for age, meaning 89% of people have less calcium than you do. You're at the top of your class in a bad way. And on the other hand, if you're 72 years old, it's probably going to say you're in the 15th percentile. You still got to take some measures, but you don't need quite as many measures. Though I had a patient yesterday, 72 years old. He was a proud zero and 75-year-olds that are a proud zero. That's really what we should see more often. Wow. And what do you think if someone's a healthy vegan, do you expect them to be a zero? Well, you know, that's one of my favorite topics when I'm talking to plant-based veg fest is I've been doing this for 40 years, plant-based eating. Most people haven't. I don't consider myself immune from disease. I do the appropriate blood work. I've had two calcium scans and I'd urge everybody, there are some truly low risk people. They've enjoyed this diet and lifestyle for decades. They have no family history, no blood pressure, cholesterol, but you still need the right blood work. And maybe we talk two minutes about blood work. I'd still encourage most people to get checked at least once because it's a complex process about avoiding heart disease in modern Western world life. And even all your efforts may not have resisted arterial aging. So my moniker is test, not guess. And there's just no point in guessing. And speaking of tests, I was reading last month about this new test. Have you heard of it? It's a PULS, a protein unstable lesion signature. I I heard some guy talking about it because he was talking about soft plaque, which more women and young men get. And this is a test that measures that. Can you tell me about that? Well, it's not available. There is this field is called biomarkers. It's not available. So you wouldn't be able to get it done yet. It's still being developed. There is one company called, I can tell you a whole bunch of panels that do add some value to the evaluation. There's one called Chorus, C-O-R-U-S. It's a genetic test. If you're having chest pain, they can help you predict if your chest pain is from clogged arteries or not. It costs about $100. It's a value I offer to my clinic. But it's not the core one. The core one, and the, really the message for people is, even if you just know your blood pressure, know your fasting blood sugar, make sure you don't have diabetes is silent, and be critical. You want a fasting blood sugar under 85, even 100 is not normal and is pre-diabetes and is affecting your nerves, your brain, your heart, and your arteries throughout your body, is put you at risk for erectile dysfunction. You want to know your cholesterol. I'd urge people for an extra $15, you can get something called an advanced cholesterol panel where you know not just the HDL, the LDL, and all that stuff, you know uh, much more detailed. There's something called lipoprotein A, LPA. It's a genetically inherited form of cholesterol. That's where vegans can get kicked in the butt. Your lifestyle's good, but you've got something genetic. It's just a blood test. Cost twelve dollars. Lipoprotein A or LP little A or I actually have a friend who has she's extremely underweight. She's eighty years old, this wonderful lady, and she has this lipoprotein A that's high. So what does someone like do that's already a vegan eating healthy and then has this high lipoprotein A? What can they do? The first thing is just twenty percent of Americans are high. Two, I would guess 2% of Americans are getting it checked. It's considered routine in Europe. It's recommended when you see your doctor it be done in Europe. It's not made that panel. The biggest reason is what you do about it is without clarity. It is genetic, so you can't eat your way out of it. You can't exercise your way out of it. Statins don't lower it. It turns out that certain vitamins, vitamin called niacin, vitamin B3, will lower it. A vitamin called carnitine will lower it. Recently reported a vitamin called ginkgo, which is good for your brain from a tree, may lower it. But because there's not been any real economic benefit to promote generic niacin, nobody's done big studies. Now, my patients, I lower it. And there's a whole theory from Dr. Linus Pauling, PhD. Many people know him as the vitamin C guy. But there's data that taking additional vitamin C can insulate you from the effects on your arteries. But the bottom line is first, get checked. 
And then Google my name and lipoprotein A. I'm one of three, four, or five doctors in the country that seem to be writing about this uh, on a regular basis. I think it's a big deal because I routinely, I have delightful patients that have delightful lifestyles, but their arteries are aging. And the only thing in the blood work standing out is very high levels of lipoprotein A. So I'm going to work on it because the therapies are not very toxic by any means. Yeah. And if they're already eating animal proteins, that would be your first step for a patient that you get that has a high lipoprotein A, right? Is put them on a plant-based diet? Absolutely. Although that's not been shown to lower it, it's going to help them with all the other factors that might combine to make them at more risk. But I'll probably talk to them about niacin and, you know, I got to do follow up blood work and make sure it's safe and tolerated. But it's ripe and there are drug companies investing millions into what will be, you can buy a year's worth of niacin for $100. These drugs that will be tested will be, you know, $30,000 a year kind of drugs. So Exactly. And it may be adequate just to not smoke, stay thin, eat plants, exercise. And because vegans do have an advantage, we eat more vitamin C containing foods, citrus greens than the average person. And that does help you in this battle. But I get pretty aggressive on it because I just seen people suffer from it. Yeah. And I'm curious about the LDL. What is the number under 80? Yeah. That'd be, you know, if your cholesterol is 150, your LDL is probably going to be under 80 unless you have extremely low HDL. So that's the American College of Cardiology and others talk about a goal under 100, a goal under 70 if you have heart disease. But again, I'd get an advanced cholesterol panel so you have a little more detail on it. And tell us a little bit about homocysteine I'm kind of interested in because I've been really into these MTHFR and these genetic mutations. And this is related to the homocysteine from the way I understand it, that when you have this mutation at the MTHFR or the MTRR gene, that it doesn't allow the homocysteine to get a methyl donor that it needs to convert it to B12 and to folate. So then the homocysteine kind of builds up and this causes things like dementia. Uh, infertility, cancer even. And so then they usually get put on some kind of methyl B vitamins, right, to help lower the homocysteine. Is that correct? That's correct. Homocysteine is, I'd put it a notch below lipoprotein A. Basically, a pediatrician about 45 years ago identified children that had evidence of damage to the vascular system and identified this uh, amino acid in the blood, homocysteine, that was sky high. And then subsequently, the genetics have been worked out, and you can inherit from your parents one or two slow and inadequate genes that are called MTHFR genes. And if you say it fast, it's a motherfucker gene. Right. <laughs> the motherfucker gene can really do a motherfucking thing to your arteries. Mm -hmm. And all the patients love that anyway. They say, hey, you know, I knew I was a motherfucker. Now you tested it and I really am. You can get a blood test called homocysteine. You're right. And if yours is sky high, you probably have a genetic defect. And for a few more bucks, your doc can draw your MTHFR genetic status and prove that your parents gave you those genes. And the cool thing about it, you're right, it affects every cell in every body and metabolism from the brain to the toes. But the proper prescribed B-complex vitamins, which actually are from a vitamin shop, not even in a prescription necessarily, can correct the cycle almost back to normal. And all you got to do is recheck the homocysteine level and it came down. Now, in adults, it's a little less clear how big a factor it is. We know homocysteine damages arteries. We're again left with that question, are we saving lives by putting lots of people on B-complex vitamins of the proper kind? But it's so close to harmless. You know, they're water-soluble vitamins don't build up in the body. They're not very expensive. That again, that's a typical strategy to check. Very rare that people get their homocysteine level checked in a routine family doctor's office. Yeah, I've always had to fight with my doctor about it. He's like, oh, I don't believe in that. And I'm like, okay, I honor that you don't believe in it, but I do. So can you write that prescription? <laughs> so that's, why I think, one of the hardest things, honestly, because it gets hard to find a doctor when you know something that you want. And if they don't want to do it, they don't. And then you're stuck. It's Then you have to get another doctor. And that's not so easy with the, all the out-of-pocket for insurance. The way it's running these days, it's not easy to just go to the doctor anymore and say, I want to get this test because you're paying the first $6,000 of your medical expenses out of your own pocket. Although many of these things that we've tied, you know, the CAT scans are 100 bucks, the lipoprotein A levels, 20 bucks, 
almost 16 levels, 15 bucks. An advanced cholesterol panel might cost you under 50 bucks. So you've exceeded what most people get by a tremendous amount with a relatively small investment. Yeah, and you can do it all, a lot of this stuff at home. You can buy a lot of these tests online at places now, like these home blood lab tests, you know, makes it really easy and affordable. I'm really curious. I don't know much about the TMAO marker that you talk about. Three researchers at the Cleveland Clinic in about 2010 were kind of asking the question, in 1961, we identified cholesterol as a factor in the blood that can cause plaque. There's got to be some other stuff. Just like a tomato doesn't only have lycopene, a tomato has hundreds of beneficial support for the health. There's got to be more than just your blood sugar and your cholesterol. They narrowed it down to three candidates based on some animal studies and genetic studies, and they decided to focus on a chemical nobody had heard of in the clinical world, four letters, T M A O trimethylamine oxide, but nobody needs to know that. Then they developed a way to measure it in the blood. Then they took 4,000 patients in the calf lab at the Cleveland Clinic, and they measured the test, and they looked at their arteries, and there was a very strong relationship between the blood level and the amount of blockage. The more blockage, the higher the blood level. And then they already had an idea how we form this in the body. Everybody's got some. It's a matter what your level is. And they did studies that proved basically the coolest thing. If you eat eggs or if you eat red meat and you are an omnivore like a typical American, the bacteria in your gut will turn choline in eggs and carnitine in meat into TMAO in your bloodstream. And then they prove that TMAO destroys arteries. It causes plaque to form, causes your HDL cholesterol to be ineffective, causes scarring in your kidneys. It may also cause scarring in your heart. And there are now more than 1,000 studies that have come on the scene in humans, clearly large studies all over the world. It's no longer the Cleveland Clinic. that says this is something that can be measured, although there's only one lab that offers it. It's the Cleveland Clinic's own proprietary lab. I have ordered these tests on my patients for about a year and a half, thousands of people. You can measure it. You stop their meat. You stop their eggs. It goes down. Vegans were tested at the Cleveland Clinic. They can't make this product, even if they're fed eggs and meat, because their microbiome, their bacteria have not learned how to convert it into TMAO. Wow. That's when people say, where do you get your protein? I say, where do you get your TMAO? That's my jackass answer to the question. And we know that the Mediterranean diet may help lower it. We know that eliminating eggs and red meat may help lower it. There may be a probiotic one day that changes your gut flora to help lower it. We don't know that. There's some data that balsamic vinegar may lower it. And a lot of people, the last part is a lot of people take vitamins, and I'm a vitamin guy. I like vitamins. A lot of people take vitamins that have carnitine and choline in their sports drink. It's in Red Bull and such. I have had many patients now with sky high levels and they're vegan. And as soon as I stopped their sports drink or whatever, their levels came down to normal. And I think that's good for them because nobody yet reported that TMAO is good for you. We've only reported that these sky high levels are related and adverse. And it's more than it's just a marker. It's been shown to actually cause atherosclerosis in arteries. So it's like there was smoking and diabetes and blood pressure. Hmm, interesting. So even as a supplement, it's not good, carnitine. Well, it's interesting because it's going to still depend on your gut. So there are people that take carnitine and their TMAO is normal. People take carnitine and their TMAO is sky high. Bottom line is, unless you do the blood test, you don't know. I have fortunate access. Again, it's a blood test. It's maybe $22. It's it's available, but you just got to find a practitioner that runs Cleveland Heart Labs. Yeah. Okay. And what three tips could you leave the listeners with to keep their hearts healthy and avoid disease? Yeah. I mean, they're simple and they're so obvious. One, eat as many friggin' fruits and vegetables, preferably organic as you can in a day. No excuses. Stop whining every day, everywhere in the world. Apples, grapes, bananas, mangoes, papayas, peas, beans, lentils, and on and on. Number two, get a cardiac calcium score. Know your score, test not guess. It's critical, it's inexpensive. And number three, and for heart health, I'm just going to tell you, get a good night's sleep. Sleep has come on board as ever. Story. When I was in medical school 30 years ago, sleep was a one hour lecture for people that were 500 pounds and was a rare disorder that Charles Dickens wrote about in the Pickwickian papers called the Pickwickian syndrome. Now it's strongly related to your brain health, your heart health, your heart rhythm health, and there is no substitute. So I no longer get up at four in the morning to make sure I get to the gym by 4.45. I'm doing concentrated yoga and HIIT and other ways of utilizing my time and still getting my sleep. So it's, it's critically important in a world where we can be, you know, online and tweeting nonstop. It's important to calm down 
That is. That's good advice. And tell people how they can follow you in your work. Sure. I'm an old man with a lot of social media exposure now. So Twitter, I love, at Dr. J. Khan. What is that? Seven letters, D-R-J-K-A-H-N. Every day, every day, every day, medical articles. That's all I really put on Twitter. Dr. Joel Kahn on Facebook. Oh, actually, that's my website, drjoelkahn.com. And Dr. Joel Kahn, America's Healthy Living Heart Doc, is on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. It's usually just food pictures from the restaurant. And you have a new book coming this summer, but your book you just came out, The Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses. How's that been? Yeah, it's been wildly successful. It talks more about calcium scoring, less about vegan medicine. First book called The Whole Heart Solution is a national public television special playing all over America right now, which is a thrill. People text me from San Francisco. You know, I woke up at two in the morning. I saw your face. It's kind of a cool way to get the heart health message and a vegan message out. I actually have two new books coming out this summer. I have a book called The Plant-Based Solution that'll be out at the end of the year. It's a good vegan medicine book I needed to write. And I have a book coming out this summer with Ellen Jaffe Jones called Vegan Sex. And you're going to want to read it under the covers. We were putting in a vibrating spine, so you'll get sensory (laughs) and information. Oh, that's great. Well, hopefully after your books come out, we'll do another interview and talk about that. But I'll promote your work as much as possible because I know you're an endless advocate of a plant-based diet and just helping people all over. So thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. It's been a joy. Yeah, it's been great. And I so appreciate you taking the time to talk with me, Dr. Joel. All right. God bless you and your listeners. And it's really all like it. I know sometimes I get a little off the cuff. It's really about trying to get authentic health messages. You don't have to do it perfect. The more perfect you do it, the more benefit there'll be. But question, question, question. We all know about fake news and there's a lot of fake health news and a lot of biased and money driven health news. And you always be better in the produce department than you will be anywhere else. That's for sure. Thanks again, and you have a great plant-based day out there. All right, you too. Rock on. Wow, you guys, was that episode information-packed or what? I bet most of you had never heard of the CACS, coronary artery calcium scan. Or how about testing of your blood level of lipoprotein little a? Had you heard of that one or done that one? I only learned about that test a couple years ago when a friend of mine brought me her blood work to look at and her doctor had done that one and I had to read all about it because I had never heard of it. But it sounds like these are tests we need to put on our to-do list for our next health checkup, guys. Do some research because likely you can get your blood work done at some online labs that you can order from your home and save money. The CACS scan, you may need a prescription from your doc, but check out where you live and go online because Dr. Joel said sometimes they have centers that set up screenings and they can offer this test and you might find a place that does that and maybe even without a prescription. But if you do need a script, then the next time you go to your doc, you know what to ask them for. Well, I think Dr. Joel explains so much about how diet is the single biggest factor for heart health. He goes on to say that it even supersedes our genes. He went on to say how dangerous the paleo trend is because animal proteins are filled with saturated fats that just get your heart into big trouble. So I think after hearing this cardiologist, you guys, you should know by now that the paleo, Atkins, Weston Price, GAPS, or any version of these low-carb diets are outright dangerous in the long run to your health. Plant-powered is the only way to go. And listen to this cardiologist and look what he's done. That should tell you a lot. Lastly, I just love that he said that the lower your cholesterol, the better your heart health will be. And I love that because there's so many lies out there about how it's so dangerous to have low cholesterol and how vegans are putting themselves at risk by having low cholesterol. But yet, all these plant-based cardiologists are saying the lower your cholesterol, the longer you'll live. I love that. And of course, there's other factors, you know, genes do play a role. And of course, lifestyle is a huge role. But I'm happy I got to talk to him about that because that's something I really wanted him to set the record straight for all of us with. Okay, I hope he answered all your questions. And I hope you learned how a high complex carb diet is the only diet of health. So remember, please don't fear the poor carb. Just stay away from the simple carbs that are in processed foods and junk foods. They're not good for anyone. And speaking of healthy, 
Did I tell you guys about this detox that Lloyd and I are doing? It's a 28-day detox where you eat only raw fruit and veggies, and you can't have seeds or nuts or even any fat like avocado. So wish us luck. This is going to be a hard one. But as you guys know, Lloyd has this chronic nerve pain in his feet, and I read this amazing book. And we're doing this as a first step just to hit his reset button. Although we eat really clean and organic and a lot of raw, we just need to follow this protocol to the T and this is the first step. So I'll keep you guys posted, okay? It's not going to be easy, but I'll let you know how it goes. Okay, you guys, you know what time it is, right? It's been a long one today. It's time to say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed the show today, my podcast family. So until next week, eat your carbs in organic whole food form and enjoy. Vidal has spoken. Remember, you heal with a plant-powered diet, homeopathy, and detoxing, of course. Peace. Be healthy. Be free. Live life.